good afternoon. Um, my name's Adam Parman, so I'm a partner at Ayla and Rinfleisch Gadoff, a law firm specialising in all things maritime, based in Hamburg and London. Uh, and welcome to what promises to be an insightful panel discussion on the multifaceted world of shipping investments and the strategies investors and ship owners employ when, de when deciding where to deploy their capital. As I guess is always the case in our industry, and as we've heard today, regulatory frameworks, geopolitical shifts, and breakthrough technologies reshape the terrain, providing new challenges and opportunities for those investing in shipping. And then, of course, we have the less headline-catching factors, strong relationships, expertise, tradition, credit risk. These are all factors which hopefully we'll discuss today. And in this session, we'll explore how different types of investors, whether they're ship owners or funds, evaluate and adapt their strategies to this dynamic landscape to make nuanced investment decisions. We'll also talk about what to look for in sale and leaseback deals and joint ventures before giving each panelist the chance to act the fortune teller and make some future predictions. I'm joined today by Bastian Hagerboyka, Emma Kaywood, Sibrin Hoekstra, Felix Nolka, and Hans Aust Heiberg. Each of our panelists brings a wealth of experience and unique perspective that can shed light, hopefully, on these topics. Without further ado, before diving into the discussion, now seems like a good moment for each to introduce themselves and what they do. So I'll start with you, Bastian. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, my name is Bastian Hagebeuka. I'm a partner and co-founder of uh, a shipping investment management firm, uh, which has historically invested in the uh, core sectors within shipping, container and dry bulk, and now very recently moved into new waters um, and entering into the offshore wind industry. And we act as an investment management firm uh, with very close and, and partnership relationships uh, with our technical partners. Thanks, Adam. Um, Cetus Maritime, we're a new name in the industry. We're born between uh, a merger of a merger between Asia Maritime Pacific and Hamburg Bulk Carrier. Uh, we are a handy size owner and operator focusing on minor bulks. We have a disparate global um, coverage with a very strong cargo network. <clears throat> yeah. My name is Sibran Hoekstra. Um, I'm with uh, Hudson Structured. Um, I think our business is better known under the name of Northern Shipping Funds. Uh, as Northern Shipping, we joined Hudson last year, so it's a bigger organization. Uh, the business model itself is providing finance to, to shipping through loan and lease structures, which we have done since the late 90s, uh, initially under the name of NFC then Northern Shipping in 2008, and now under the name of Hudson Structured. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Felix Nolke. I recently joined MPC Capital, where I'm heading the Maritime Investment Activities. MPC Capital is a Hamburg-based asset manager with a traditionally strong footprint in the maritime space, where we focus also on our main activities, activities across all different sectors, but most well-known, obviously, for our uh, Oslo-listed entity, MPC Container Ships. My name is Hans Ust Heiberg. I am partner and chief risk officer of Seoul Shipping. We do sale leasebacks. We've been doing this since 2005. We do most type of ships from gas carriers, bulkers, tankers, offshore vessels. We do new buildings and also older ladies. Thank you. <clears throat> so to kick things off, I'll start with a general question. Uh, and maybe I'll start with you, Bastian. When assessing investment opportunities, what for you are the key factors that you look for? Um, I think I, I need to um, explain a little bit our history as a firm. We started off in 2018, and I have to say the main strategy that we have run since then is looking at contract-covered uh, type of shipping transactions, which explains why we started off with container deals so um, using that um, as an explanation, what's driving uh, our philosophy is basically um, the contract coverage, uh, how does it help you to de-risk your investment, 
and then obviously in that perspective uh, you, you put that in contrast of uh, remaining asset life. Um, but what I have to say is over time, um, when you develop uh, the company, uh, you, you, you realize that uh, you need to expand in terms of your investment mandate. So um, what we are doing is we are looking at, and we have been doing, a more opportunistic deals as well. And uh, for me, the core point for an opportunistic deal is that somebody told me once, I don't like to... To, um, to quote on that, but I think what is a very valid point is that you need to buy right, which in the end means that um, you need to look at the entry point in a specific sector. And that is probably driving any project assessment that we are looking at um, at the first stage. And then you start running the numbers and, and you look in terms of return prospectives, etc. But I think this is the, the core element at the start. I'll jump to, to Felix now, I think, and, and ask the same question. But yeah, I just think it's much more to add. <laughs> to add. No, I think it's, <clears throat> no, I think it's, it's very rightly put by, by Bastian. So it really depends on, or you need to acknowledge the fact that this is a cyclical industry, as everyone in this room definitely does, and therefore requires a different investment strategy depending on where you are in the cycle, right? Uh, <clears throat> and therefore de-risking residual value, I think that's for all panelists going to be, and also everyone in the room, uh, the key aspects when evaluating uh, investments, but uh, I would definitely also echo what Bastian said. It's not by low or by high, but it all re <coughs> really depends on the structure to, to buy right and to buy at the right price and the right time. I guess, Emma, from a ship owner's perspective, you have a different kind of idea of, of what to look, look at, could you? Yeah, look, we're, we're a ship owner. We buy ships or we buy companies. So when we look at ships, obviously we're heavily influenced by the incoming environmental regulations. So speed and consumption, versatile assets, liquid assets are what we, we focus on primarily. We are seeing in a very real scenario, um, the more eco younger ships are attracting premiums, not, in term, not only in terms of asset value, but also in terms of charter rates. So every investment that we look at from a ship perspective we are looking at it through a very heavily skewed eco lens. Um, are our ships EUTS ready? Are they going to attract the premium that they will demand in the EU? This is how we look, look at the ships. Now, from an M&A perspective, you know, I mentioned we were born out of a recent merger. So when we look at M&A, we look at it through the quantitative lens. So we look at the assets, we look at the operating results. But more and more importantly, we're looking at the qualitative factors. So the people, their relationships, what do they bring to the table, their cargo network, um, and where they are in the world. We are trying to you know, access global reach. So yeah, that's how we look at it. Uh, and, and Cyprian, to what extent do you have a kind of concerted grand scheme, or is it more opportunistic you look at the hard, hard facts, the, the risk, reputation? Uh, yeah, so I, I would say Maybe contrary to Bastian, we are not that much focused on uh, contract coverage. So we're much more asset-focused uh, financiers. So we like liquid assets, you know, the handy size bulk or the MR product tanker, those type of ships that are kind of easy to sell. And we always look at the downside as a lender. Um, so yeah, you want to be able to sell a ship when things go, go sideways. The other element of asset-based lender is that we have a, a technical team. We have three uh, people in our technical, technical team. So we look at every ship we finance, um, then we monitor the ships um, when we follow the regulatory developments as well. So that's a responsibility of the team. And of course, when things go sideways, we have a team that actually can, can manage or manage the manager uh, if necessary. And then similar to the others, I would say in our asset-based approach, we very much look at historical numbers for ships. So the average, the low, we try to be around the average historically based on the, the, the entry point of our exposure, the break-even rates, the residual risk. We might do a little bit more if the markets are strong, so we can take a short-term view on the market, but then we would say, okay, then in the first period you have to pay repay a little bit more than than uh, than later on or in the reverse if markets are bad we actually can accept no repayments for a while just to make sure that the break even rates are at the sustainable levels um, yeah so that's our approach uh, and hans i presume your your position is very similar to sibrin's and 
manage your business, but to what extent do you also really focus on the credit worthiness and the, the risk of a particular client customer? I think we are quite similar in some ways, and we have actually looked at business together in the past. But I would actually start with saying that in the sale leaseback business that we do, that now actually, instead of looking at credit risk first, we look at ability to comply and ability to handle change. So it's very much a, a counterparty focus on management and owners. And of course, once they tick the boxes on these issues, then, it's, then it is credit risk. Then it is looking at the asset and the pricing of the asset compared to historical values. And if you get through that, then, it's, uh, then uh, we can do all sorts of segments. So it's, you know, it can be gas carriers, it can be specialized vessels, it can be offshore vessels. But the key for us is, is, is really the counterparty and ability to handle what's lying ahead of us in terms of environmental changes <clears throat> and also complying with Russia trade, sanctions. It's a very complex world out there that we have to make sure that we na manage to navigate. Thanks. And <clears throat> Emma, you've kind of touched on this already, but to what extent is EU ETS and the more kind of environmental regulation really informing, impacting on your decision making? I mean, I mean it's the number one consideration for us um, in most of our investment decisions. You know, we went through in the last year um, a very large, or the last two to, two to three years, a very large scale fleet renewal. We bought and sold net 40 ships, and that was in view of complying with incoming regulations, including EUTS. What, what that means for our ships is that we are looking, like I said, at the younger and more, the more eco ships that will attract that premium in the U EU. We, we think markets are rational. They're already pricing in that the younger ships will attract a premium um, in those regions, So, which is what has informed um, our, our fleet renewal. Uh, and Bastian, to what extent the similar factors impact on Blue Star's business? I think it's, uh, for us, it's, uh, it's more a combination of not necessarily fleet renewal, but more managing and enhancing the existing fleet. So I would really like to pick up what uh, the last panel has, uh, from my perspective, very clearly pointed out, that there are so many things that you can do with your existing fleet, um, which are not CapEx heavy, um, and you can do that together with your customers, with the charterer, um, and you profit and benefit from it immediately. It doesn't take years, as for example, new fuel developments and, and, and propulsion technologies take, uh, you can easily gain uh, by just retrofitting with proven technologies. And this is what we have done, and we have done that um, uh, rather sooner than later on all of our ships, together with our clients, the charters. And it's very welcomed. So in the end, this is the starting point, which doesn't necessarily mean that we would ignore investing in newer vessels and newer technologies, but it's, it's, it's the, the strategy that you can do immediately and that you can execute on based on what you... Uh, what you have within your fleet. And it's, it's something where we see that many people are doing it, so I would also like to add uh, to what we have had before um, and, and basically um, confirm that. Uh, retrofitting is an active program that almost everybody, at least in, in, in the specific sectors, uh, is performing on, and it will lead to um, a successful achievement of the 2030 targets as well apart from, obviously, slower steaming, etc. cetera. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and Felix, would you echo kind of Bastian's approach here, or do you have a... Yeah, no, I think it's well, what Bastian mentioned is very important, is in conjunction with the customers, ultimately, so that you, as ship owners, cannot really take the technology risk, everything just by yourself, and being successful in sharing the technology burden is going to be important going forward to achieving the goals. And Sibyl, I, I guess for you, it's a different emphasis on the environmental side of things. It's more the customer takes the lead and maybe you could... Yeah, that's amplify. correct. Um, yeah, I would say our technical team is primarily focused on the ES, uh, environmental issues. We have an ESG, ESG committee, so um, 
and on the environmental side, they follow the, the regulatory uh, requirements. Um, in our lending or finance, we sometimes include some of the, uh, or you know, sometimes we do include some of the covenants which relate to uh, ESG. Um, for instance, we, I mean, we, we finance more 10 to 15 year old ships, so not the new builds because they're just too expensive and our money doesn't work uh, for that type of uh, investment. So it's a 10 to 15 year old ships. We have deals where we say, okay, we can give you a three year deal with two year extension option, but then the extension is dependent on your CII rating. So you have to be C rated to get the extension. So in that way, we try to implement some of these ESG type of elements. And Hans, the CII rating, to what extent does that impact on, on what you're doing and the types of customers that you can finance? I think we take a very similar approach to what Sibrin and his business is doing. And we have, we have an ESG committee, we have an ESG plan, and it's part of the contractual obligations with the counterparty. And they have to report on this quarterly, and uh, we have our technical people, they follow the ships regularly and, uh, and check that we comply. But ultimately, it's the counterparty that has to deal with it. So that's why we start with you know, checking whether they have the capability to do it. This next question is really for Emma and Bastian, but what's your current sentiment towards new builds uh, against second-hand tonnage? So again, speaking from the perspective of a ship owner and in the handy size sector, um, opportunistic investments in this environment are, they're tough. We see a large dislocation between asset values and charter rates. So pulling the trigger at this moment is tough for us. We are still constructive on the market. The supply and demand fundamentals remain very strong for the handy size segment. Um, I mentioned we'd gone through a large-scale fleet renewal, and next steps for us are growth. So how are we going to grow? Are we growing with second-hand vessels, or are we growing with new builds? Our house view is that new builds are too expensive, especially considering the, the current cost of steel and second-hand um, second vessel levels, and of course, rates. That's before we consider environmental regulations, how they continue to change, um, uncertain future propulsion, and not to mention financing. So second-hand vessels, that's, that's, how, that's what we're focusing on. Larger bulkers, no older than 2013. So these vessels that we're focusing on right now, by 2030, they'll be 80% through their useful economic life. A new building by 2030 will only be 30% through its useful economic life. So that is really how we're managing our residual risk in that space. Sorry, Bastian. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very difficult question, uh, but in the end, it's also a very easy answer uh, from my perspective. I think the, the overall exercise that all of us uh, need to go through, not only within shipping, but in all sectors, is that we are already behind the time of solving for the overall problem with regards to uh, emission reduction. So every step that we need to do is in terms of the more capex heavy it might be, so going into new buildings with new propulsion technologies, I think what we have seen is that the parties who have, have profited the most from recent developments were able to uh, reinvest capital that, they had, um, uh, that had, they had made over time into forcing the, the engine manufacturers and the yards to, uh, to make vessels available that can uh, basically run on methanol or, uh, in the end, ammonia. Um, but what I, what, I want to, uh, what I want to lead to is basically that um, in, in order to solve for the greater problem, it will become a, a joint exercise at some point. And then, only then, I think the smaller elements, as I would consider, for example, our firm, um, within the packing order and in the value chain, can also invest into such a technology because we cannot take a uh, technological risk on a new building um, in terms of where we stand within the market and what we are offering the market. But as soon as, as, uh, as our customers, the charterers, are opening up in a way that they say we need to share the overall capex burden, um, then it becomes an interesting area uh, to, to, de to develop that jointly. 
Um, so I'm I'm uh, I'm a fan of 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 investing in new buildings in case um, you can share that. I'm a huge fan of that. But um, taking a technological risk um, and doing it speculatively is is for us uh, it's not the right right point in time. <clears throat> One of the things which struck me this year is that well this time last year there's a lot of talk about wind energy and investing in ships associated with that particular segment, uh, whereas this year there's been been no mention of it. And I was wondering, and again, maybe Bastian and Felix specifically, whether there's, whether you consider that to still be a potential area um, of, of interest? Well, <clears throat> it has not been an, uh, a topic that was primarily for us. I think, again, really needs to be driven to some degree also by, uh, by the customer's demands, but at the moment has not been a major driver for us. Uh, and, and given what we've heard today and the geopolitical risks, regulatory <coughs> kind of framework that we, that we live in, what sectors do you think are kind of poised for growth? Uh, maybe, Sibrin, you can you kick off with that. Uh, growth or doing well? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's the, uh, the gas sector is, is doing well. I mean, there's a big order book, but the demand is huge as well. And so you have longer trading lanes, and so I think and you have the Panama Canal issue which, you know, with the congestion, so that all helps on the, uh, you know, on the, on the, on improving the, this, the, the gas, gas market. And I think the other one too are the, the tankers, where there's also, you know, dislocation between where the, the, the products are produced and where they are being used. You have the Ukraine war. And then the other one is offshore, which is lately booming. Uh, we also have done a few offshore deals. Uh, we haven't we did the last one in 2016, and only this year we kind of, uh, you know, tapping our toes toes in in the water on the on the offshore. So those those three sectors are actually they have a, a good outlook. But I think in you know I've been 30 years in shipping, and I think in general there are always ups and downs, and it's two or three years of you know decent market, and then there's a down again. So so that will happen here as well. Uh, and Hans, do you think there are any particular segments that are facing strong headwinds? Headwinds. <laughs> they seem to be doing quite well. At least the tankers are doing well. And uh, but the, maybe the bulkers are the ones that will have the toughest time. Thanks. So we, so we touched on the kind of investment criteria which you, you all tend to employ. Um, moving on to more specifically joint ventures and and sell and lease that type of deal with, deals which Sibrin and, and Hans, Hans do. But on joint ventures, and this is for Emma, Felix and, and Bastian really, when evaluating potential joint ventures, what, what are your primary considerations? And maybe we'll start with you, Bastian. Um, yes, so I think uh, a joint venture is, um, is, a, is a great starting point in terms of uh, looking at a project together, in terms of uh, sharing economics uh, on a project together and sharing a view on something. But I think what, what is very important in a joint venture is that um, you follow the same goal and it's very transparently discussed and, and uh, you have the same strategy in mind um, because when you, when you don't have that, um, the bigger the joint venture becomes. So when more parties than just two are involved, um, it can become complex um, in, uh, in the near term or in the midterm. So I would say that um, handling a joint venture is uh, extremely important for shipping as an industry because we are a capex intensive industry. So I think everybody, almost everybody probably in this room has entered into some sort of joint venture uh, in the projects uh, that you're entering. Um, but managing a joint venture is really dependent on specific rules, governance, alignment of interest, the typical phrases that always come up immediately. But I, they are important and they, they are um, uh, basically the core and the DNA of every partnership. And when, I mean, the name partnership says it, uh, mm -hmm. partners, um, uh, might disagree on some elements but uh, in some times, but in the end, as long as the overall target uh, and, uh, and the ambition or the goal of that specific joint venture is defined and always transparently discussed, um, uh, there's always ways to work it out. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of joint ventures. 
uh, it's it's a core of what we are doing, um, and I think it's also very important to um, to to scale and develop to develop projects together with partners with investors, um, um, and uh, uh, I see a huge success there uh, overall for for almost yeah the majority of the people within our industry. Uh, and Emma, I'm <clears throat> I'm guessing you've got other things to add to. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about this in reference to um, a recent joint venture agreed between Cetus Maritime and Young Sijan Financial. We closed a joint, joint venture in the last couple of months. Um, the mandate of that joint venture is to acquire four to eight handy sized vessels which, within a, a specific um, investment profile. So, like I said, uh, no younger than two, no older than 2013, 38k, um, and more on the eco side. So we've already placed one vessel into this joint venture, and we're actively looking for for forward candidates. Um, the, the market's tough, so you know nothing on the table right now. But again, looking to grow this joint venture. So why did we decide to to enter into this joint venture with Young Sijan? So we wanted to de-risk the acquisition price at current market levels. Um, doing that with a partner made sense to us, you know, obviously a, a reduced equity contribution. We also took the opportunity to expand Cetus's controlled fleet. Um, for us, it's important that with scale comes greater opportunities. That means we could leverage and grow our cargo network um, and we could deliver, you know, deliver that premium commercial management to our partner. We also wanted to expand our access to diversified equity investors, so China in this case. Um, we are still seeing um, a very <coughs> positive outlook from Chinese investors to the dry bulk segment, um, which is positive for us. And finally, there was access to Chinese shipyards. So as a ship owner, while I said we're not looking at new buildings actively right now, growing the ties with the Chinese shipbuilder means that we could potentially have preferential treatment um, in the future. This partner in particular, they, they know shipping, they're shipbuilders. Um, so they have a very strong view of the dry bulk segment and then particularly the handy size segment. So we see them as a long-term partner that understands us and our business. And as Bastian said, you know, we had the common goal and the common strategy, which made this joint venture go off without a hitch for now. Thank you. Uh, and Felix? Uh yeah, I think my predecessors basically mentioned almost everything, <clears throat> but I think it basically boils down to the fact that um, it will be important that partners see eye to eye and add value to the overall uh, to the overall joint venture in general. Because if, if that doesn't happen, you'll have the misalignments, you'll have all the all the topics that Basti mentioned as going to kick in, and therefore the value add, be it more efficient access to capital, better price capital, be it a different sector, be it a bit different technical management or capabilities, that's going to be the driver for that, for the success. And maybe if I may add one thing, which just comes up, I think complementary know-how and, and experience is also something that can be very valuable in a, in a joint venture. I mean, we have just, just recently announced that we have uh, entered a joint venture together with Diana Shipping. Uh, together with ASSC, um, um, a company close to us here in Hamburg, um, um, and their offshore wind outfit, and another um, uh, non-shipping related institutional investor um, out of Germany. And within that structure of those four partners, you see that everybody brings, in terms of know-how, a different skill set to the table, which is basically uh, rounding up the story in a sector that uh, uh, that that still from our perspective, is a very young and, 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 and early in its overall development, I think this is very valuable. And we have, and we see that, that especially in that field, um, other ship owners uh, are similarly motivated uh, with competitors um, in that sector, where also um, like-minded ship owners who are strong competitors in other areas join forces and, and build, uh, build a company together. The company I'm mentioning is Edda Wind. So in the end, I think a joint venture is not only about bundling resources capital-wise, I think very, very strong joint ventures are also driven by complementary experience. Um, uh, this is for Sibrin and, and Hans, really. In your sale and leaseback transactions, what are your primary areas of, of focus? And maybe Hans, we'll start with you. 
I guess we are partners, but it's, it's in the sense that where we are financial owners, the, the counterpart is an operational owner. And in, in that respect, we kind of, we sell upside against downside protection. So it's, both parties have equity in the game, but it's, uh, we have a more conservative equity than, the, than our counterpart. Uh, um, yeah, I would say today most of our deals are uh, senior secured loans. Um, but yeah, so if you compare a, a loan with a lease, in the lease we ownership, and if we do a loan, we, we receive a first mortgage. But the underlying structures are the same, so both have an interest and a repayment component. What you tend to see, what we tend to see is that if leverage is high, say you go to 80, 85 percent finance, which we might do in a low point in the cycle, then we prefer to be closer to the asset, so own it and then bareboat it back. Uh, today, most deals are, I would say, between 60 and 70 percent finance based on today's market value. And so there we, we see more <coughs> because the, the equity piece is big. Um, so there we see the senior secured uh, uh, structures. I think another element with sale and lease back is that some of the uh, lease providers, they need debt in their structures. So then they can provide a mortgage to the bank and then they, they take the rest themselves. Whereas in our case, we do all the deals unlevered. So it's all our capital. So we don't need additional finance to, to make the structure work. I think that's uh, not a differentiator. Um, I think what's interesting today is that uh, you have the, the sanctions issue with R Russia. Um, as a lender, when you have a mortgage, you are several steps removed from the actual trade. So I think one of the discussions we have internally is if what if you do a sale and lease back, you are the owner. Of course, the Babu Charter is the disponent owner. But you might be one step closer to actually, you know, operating the ship. So is that an additional consideration of not doing sale and lease backs? Thanks. Uh, I wanted to take a step back a bit. I should have asked this maybe earlier, but um, probably more Bastian, Sibrin and, and Hans. But when you're looking at investments, to what extent do the people that are investing in you kind of define what you should do what you should invest in, or do they say, we trust your expertise, you know what you're doing, it's the cash, enjoy. Um, um, start with maybe Bastian. <laughs> um, so it's, it's always a combination. In our case, it's a combination. We don't have discretionary capital from investors, so the project needs to convince them, and our track record, and basically the, the trust that we gain over time is the second element. So I think it's... Uh, that's my short answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I would say track record is a big thing. Um, I mean, our track record goes back more than um, 20 years, and we basically made no losses for, for the period, so we, we provide a decent return to our investors. It's all unlevered. Uh, it's asset-based, so that, that's attractive. Um, the... Um, yeah, so then in addition, our investors are institutional investors, uh, so they're all from the U.S. Our current fund is 630 million, and so they would like to see a diversified portfolio. So we have restrictions on how much we can invest in one sector, so it's like 35% per subsector, so tanker, dry bulk, offshore, or container. And then we have 15% per customer and 15% per deal. So in that way, we diversify the portfolio and, and the risk. So those are all elements they like. And finally, Hans. Yeah, we're fairly similar. We, are, we have full discretion, so we can invest in, as long as it's a floating asset with a propeller, we can do it regardless of age or sector, segment. We have a concentration risk of maximum 20% on one counterparty. We also primarily have institutional money. And the key for us is to really to report on a quarterly basis and keep uh, our investors updated on what's, kind of what's going on. And as long as we keep on paying dividends, they're happy. Thanks. So t time is slowly running down. I just wanted to ask one final question to each of you. And this is 
your kind of ideas of the future? And, and, and how do you envision investments in the shipping industry evolving, changing in five to ten years? Where do you think will be the real area of, of, of interest, of growth? And maybe we'll start with Hans. <coughs> Well, I think I have to go back to what I said initially. It's, the, uh, it's going to be with the, with the counterparties that can uh, comply and handle the changes that lie ahead. Um, tickets may get bigger, but I think uh, it's really up to the owners that manage to, to, or the counterparties that manage to comply with rules and regulations, be it uh, sanctions or be it... Uh, uh, emissions. I think that's going to be the key. Uh, Felix? Yeah, I would agree that, that tickets are going to increase. Um, I also believe that <clears throat> the panel has shown that there is a that there's a drive towards cooperation, joint ventures, and that is also going to extend far beyond also rather closer to the to the clients and to the end customers who are the beneficiaries when it comes to new propulsions, new technologies and the likes. So um, there will be, there needs to be a sharing of burden across different shoulders, and um, I believe that that's what we're going to see as well. Super. Um I think one other interesting uh, issue uh, going forward is the interest rate environment, and then the related to that, the kicking down the roads uh, by the banks in the last ten years. Um, so what you had was that interest rates were at zero and the margin was very low. So banks in you know, difficult times were able to kick the can down the road and, which, and then over time kind of solve their problems. Going forward, if interest rates stay at today's levels, there's no way banks can kick the can down the road, so which will force then restructuring or selling assets, banks taking losses. And so I think that creates a much more healthier economic environment uh, than we have seen in the last few years. In the last few years, you had owners that had no money and they didn't have to pay the bank, and other owners had money and they actually had to pay the bank. So it was unfair competition. Okay, again, from the perspective of a ship owner, um, we are going to continue to invest in optimization technologies that's in the technical space and in the operational space. We're going to continue to invest in ancillary functions. That's ESG, that's risk, that's business intelligence. Um, and finally, we're going to continue to invest in consolidation. That's mergers and acquisitions, looking to acquire other shipping companies, other operating companies. That's where we're spending our dollars. Thank you. And finally, Bastian. I think uh, what uh, the, the unfortunate situation with COVID has shown not only to our industry, but also to many other, other industries, is that shipping is, as we heard in the panel before, is extremely important globally for the, the global economy. So that has led to a situation where new investors are looking at our asset class. So I think there's appetite, to, more capital to come in, um, which is, from my perspective, also required because of the challenges that have been discussed during the day today, it means that a lot of capital is necessary going forward. Um, and I think uh, these two things combined with the fact that shipping was always creative as an industry and is always creative of investing in, in the various ways, in the various markets, in the various cycles, is a combination um, uh, that looks quite prosper in the future. So I think it's, it's very interesting times ahead. Thank you. That's, that's it. Um, thank you. I just want to express my gratitude to the panellists for taking their time and providing some insights into investments. And also thanks to the Capital Link team for putting on this wonderful event. Thank you all. Thank you.